Hello, and welcome to class 20024 FRM 4, Interrupt and Task Scheduling, No RTOS Required. My name is Chris Tucker. I am a senior applications engineer at Microchip Technology, and I work in the MCU8 division. Microcontrollers are everywhere in the world. They occupy products that we use every day. However, the scope of how they are implemented for each application is different based upon the requirements. At a basic level, those requirements are controlled by a single pin, configured to work digitally as high or low, capable of input or an output. They can additionally be set up to work as analog, possibly measuring a variable input through an ADC, an analog to digital converter, or outputting through a DAC, a digital to analog converter. Remember, though, that we live in a complex world and often are required to observe and manage multiple tasks at the same time. This is no different for an embedded system. There are a wide range of pinout options when it comes to microcontrollers, supporting a wide range of available memory and peripheral options. These support us, the developers, with quite a collection of resources at our disposal. But this great power does carry with it the weight of responsibility. That responsibility to design a product which performs as expected, behaving as designed, while working at the response speed desired. Additionally, as coders, it is our job to build firmware in a way which reacts with minimum latency, executes fast throughput speeds, is scalable, efficient, and properly synchronized not to mention readable and easy to navigate or expand. To achieve these goals, we will be required to schedule our operations through cooperative or preemptive processing, utilizing simple but powerful techniques. To properly ensure a strong knowledge of the required tools for application scheduling, this class will make sure that when you walk out of the class, you will understand concurrency, the key principles involved, and limitations. You will understand how interrupts work, potential problems with them, and best practices to ensure the desired behavior. Recognize simple scheduling techniques and effectively replicate the behavior using a PIC MCU with no RTOS required. This class contains a lot of material, each topic powerful in its own way. In this class, we will briefly attempt to describe and illustrate the more important concepts. Through this installation of knowledge, it is the hope that you as a developer will better be equipped and empowered when preparing your application system design for operation. This class will ask you to think about the concepts and give you the knowledge to make a capable decision when encountering resource constraints during development. The agenda is as follows. First, I will be describing concurrency, why it is important, what issues could occur, and how to overcome these. Next, we will dive deeper into interrupts, what they are, how they work, when they should be used, and why they can become problematic. After this discussion, Lab 1 will be performed to demonstrate and reinforce the ideas. With concurrency understood, we will review cooperative and preemptive processing, how they are leveraged by a microcontroller for hybrid processing. Lab 2 will build off of these processing concepts and demonstrate methods to overcome concurrency issues shown in Lab 1. Briefly, we will talk about real-time operating systems, how they work, what is supplied, and general cost of their implementations. After this, the class will outline multiple scheduling techniques in their barest form, discussing general implementations and methods of execution. Lab 3 will continue to build off of Lab 2, but focuses more on using the scheduling techniques in an abstracted, yet easily portable and expandable code example. Finally, we will summarize. Let's move on to our first agenda topic, concurrency. What is concurrency? Simply put, it is a process which executes in a deterministic way from a defined start to an end with an expected result. In other words, it is the order in which things go from A to B within a single task. This may be a single independent action or a set of actions which must be executed in a known order to reach a conclusion 
for the required task. For example, if I was to enter a room, I would lower my arm, open my hand, grasp the handle, turn it, pull the door towards me. After the door has passed my body, I will release the handle, step through the door, reach back, and shut it behind me. This set of actions are all dependent upon the last, and the process must be completed in whole to accomplish the task. Because of this deterministic nature, I know that if I perform all steps in order without being interrupted, the end result will be that I have entered the room. Performing a single concurrent task is easy. However, things become more complex when managing multiple concurrent requirements all at one time. Imagine having to juggle while also entering the room. Concurrency occurs naturally within a system. It is deterministic within its process. It executes to an expected result if repeated without variation. It's complicated when multiple tasks must occur at the same time and may or may not need to interact with other concurrent tasks. Let's give another example, this time using terminology that will be discussed further throughout this lecture. We are going to brush over these topics now and dive deeper later. This will be done through the course to familiarize yourself with the terms, but also will describe them later in a more technical way. The concurrent process is going to be driving home after a long day of work. This is an action we perform commonly, and I would wager that very often it has little deviation in the steps. As a result, this process will be relatively deterministic. We are going to exit the building, enter our car, turn on the ignition, and drive our normal path until we arrive home. There may be variations in the system which affect this concurrent process, but we will talk about those in a bit. What is known so far is the concurrent action is to drive home. The current actors are you, the driver, like a variable, and the car, the transportation method, perhaps a function call. The end result is going to be arriving home. Look at it this way. It is clear that the driver variable changes. The concurrent action of driving home does not change. The result of driving home also remains the same. For you, the process may take 10 minutes. For your buddy Bob, it may take 20. However, those times result are likely to be consistent based upon the driver or the variables which are referenced. This is because the concurrent process of driving home is deterministic. The steps for each actor, respectively, will not change, and thus the results are predictable and expected. But what happens when Bob and yourself have to share a resource, such as the road? You both are in the middle of a concurrent process of driving home. You both want to go from start to completion as quickly as possible. Since you share the road, however, if neither of you yields, there's going to be a problem. This is the same common problem we have with microcontrollers. However, our shared resources is the core CPU. Our processor can only complete one concurrent task at a time. So we are going to have to have some coding logic in place to better aid in smart decision making. Returning to the road, this is taken care of by a traffic light. This gives us a rule for access, basically something which determines what action to be performed when a specific state is occurring. This is synchronization. The light is green, go. The light is red, you must stop. That is an example of a mutex implementation. We can choose to do one of two things. Light is green, go. Light is red, stop. Light is yellow, slow or accelerate based upon the distance. This is a condition. This is an example of a semaphore. We may perform a few actions based upon different conditional variables. Management of the traffic light can be scheduled in a few different ways. Two such examples are a periodic system where the road axis is alternated between north and southbound traffic and east and westbound traffic. Or it can be event driven where the road has sensors which detect cars waiting and makes logical choices when to change the state based upon the data that is available. Regardless of the type of light scheduling done, some things are clear. 
First, the axis to the crossroad must be alternated. If it is not, then one direction will end up in deadlock, where the cars will never be able to move. Definitely can't have this happen. Second, the axis to the crossroads must be fairly distributed. Everyone needs their turn to use the crossroads. If the road's access is disproportionate, it will lead to starvation, where one direction is given more access than the other. This will result in a quite a long backup on one of those roads. Probably won't work out too well inside of a city. Deciding which traffic system is best and how road access is given is up to the traffic planner. In your system, those decisions are up to the system specification or you as the programmer. On the way home, Bob decides to not, take, not follow the rules of access and attempts to claim part of the road which is currently being used by another car. As a result, there is an interrupt, causing us to have to alter our path of execution to arrive home. Luckily, we are a good driver which follows the rules of access and we are able to react fast enough within enough latency to avoid the incident without major performance issues. Because of the detour, we are going to have to travel differently than our normal path. In the end, we are still going to get home, but now it may take a little bit longer. Because Bob did not follow the rules of access, he is now blocking. Best case, the accident is going to result in a delay, which could be cleared within a very short amount of time. The worst case, it will result in deadlock, where the road will become closed and unaccessible. Luckily, there is a side road that we are able to drive down. We had to slightly modify some of the variables, such as the connecting roads that we use to drive home. Doing so has injected jitter onto our total time. There is something unexpected which resulted in a longer than ideal throughput as a result of us having to take the longer latency to arrive home. From the scheduling perspective, what we can take from all of this is do not create a blocking condition which delays unnecessarily. Systems should be designed with small latency to react quickly for critical actions, minimalizing each task throughput to ensure system performance capable of accommodating any possible jitter which is injected upon the system. It is important to remember that cars are not the only actors which may occupy the road. In fact, some will have higher priority than cars. For example, pedestrians. Imagine a nice grandmother being escorted across the street by a friendly neighborhood child. Obviously, their safety is more important than you getting home to see the latest TV episode. In the car, we are going to come to a complete stop, waiting until they have cleared the walkway before we move on. This is an example of basic priority. It is more likely that a car will be on the road, but if a pedestrian is present, the car must yield. This is a mutex implementation. More advanced priority task handling is done in the same manner, just with more conditions for consideration. For example, you have to turn left. There is a pedestrian crossing directly in front of you. Additionally, there is another vehicle across from you which is going to travel straight. According to the rules of access, you must allow the pedestrian to cross and then allow the straight car to drive by before you are able to make your left hand turn. This is again a form of semaphore synchronization. It makes logical choices based upon multiple conditional variables which may change states during normal system operation. The end result is always going to be that we arrive home. Because of traffic or accidents, the length at which we arrive home may vary. But the result of the concurrent process of driving home will always result in arriving home. Note that even if it was us and not Bob that was in the accident, we would eventually arrive home, but the jitter injection caused on the system would be much longer. After all of that, let's reflect upon it. The concurrent process was driving home. The main resources were the road, 
It was shared by other cars and pedestrians. The rules of access were that traffic lights exist, lane merging must be handled carefully, four-way stop traffic laws must be followed, and pedestrians will always have priority. The deterministic result will be that we arrive home. Well, let's pretend that the ideal length of time that it takes to get home is a throughput of 10 minutes. But whenever we are driving home and encounter traffic, that will inject a small amount of jitter, typically about four minutes. With jitter injection caused by an accident, it will put an additional 12 minutes onto our system throughput. This means that typically, that ideally our latency is 10 minutes, but that our worst case latency could possibly be 22 minutes. Typically though, it takes 14 minutes to arrive home as we normally encounter traffic. Now let's look at a more typical concurrent task requirements for an embedded application. The microcontroller must manage an LED driver. It must monitor a battery voltage, communicate with an LCD through I2C communication, manage menus and settings through an LCD display. It has to monitor and measure a potentiometer or a dial value by using the ADC peripheral. It also must detect any smoke or CO2 levels. And in case of high levels of CO2, it must have a speaker trigger an alarm. Looking at these tasks, it is apparent that some can be processed independently, while others may be dependent upon data or results from another task. Let's just look at three of these possible tasks. I squared C communication managed by a touch LCD. This task will operate independently. Monitoring of LED driver via a PWM, or a pulse width modulation peripheral. This task is dependent upon another task. Measuring the potentiometer value via an ADC peripheral, which will then be used to modify the PWM value. This task operates independently, but is required by another task. For each of these concurrent tasks were to be processed at one time, we would require three independent processors. However, a microcontroller only has a single processor available for use. As a result, when performing multiple concurrent tasks with a microcontroller, we instead must use virtual concurrency. This is when a single processor is responsible for execution of multiple concurrent tasks. To accomplish this, the processor must allocate time to work through each task independently. If one task is dependent upon the result of another, then the order of execution may be very important. Again, look at the same three tasks, but this time using only a single processor. In this application, the LCD is managed. Then the ADC is used to produce a result, a value result. This is consumed by the LED driver to update the PWM behavior. Through this virtual concurrency, the tasks are processed cooperatively in a sequential order. Comparing the real-world example of driving home with an embedded system design, parallels to the properties can be drawn easily. The cars and people actors in the real world become tasks or threads and processes of an embedded system. The shared resources of a single road is like the single code processor of an MCU. The number of lanes mirrors a device's available program or data memory. Alternate road paths could be supported by peripheral registers. Rules of the road become rules of operation and execution for an application design. Car turn signals are like flags, indicating our system wants to change operation. Access is given to first pedestrians or police cars just as a higher priority task must be handled over lower priority tasks. At the end of the day, there must be a deterministic result, 
result returning home from work or executing all applications with the correct resulting behaviors as designed by the product's specification. The largest issue which affects a system's processing task concurrently are called race conditions. Race conditions are defined as the behavior of a system where the output is dependent on the sequence or timing of other uncontrollable events. The bugs that rear their ugly heads as a result of race conditions do so when events do not occur in the order in which the programmer had intended them. Because of the nature of how race conditions occur in a system, they are often very difficult to repeat and thus are hard to find and debug. These are sometimes referred to as Heisenbugs, which are defined as software bugs which seem to disappear or alter their behavior when one attempts to study them. This is a result of variations in the system's operation, typically related to timing, as a result of working from within a debugger or in a debug state. Let's again look at a real-world situation to better understand the race condition concept, and more importantly, its possible repercussions. In this example, let's think about a bank account. How about my bank account in particular? Assume that the account is shared by my wife and I. Each of us have our own bank cards issued granting full access. The account currently has $100 in it. My wife would like to pay our bills from her phone. I would like to buy the latest video game and so go to the ATM to withdraw cash. Assuming that both the bill and the video game are $40 a piece. Theorize that we both attempt to do a withdrawal at the exact same moment. How would the system handle that? What would happen? The behavior that we expect may look like this a balance of $100 exists in the account. From her phone, my wife views the balance, reading an account balance of $100 from the server. She requests to pay the bill of $40, writing back to the server an updated value of $60. After this is completed, I request the balance from the server and read $60. With this knowledge, I withdraw $40, and then the ATM balance is again decreased. The ATM then writes back the value of $20 to the server. That is what we would expect if everything works correctly. But what would happen if a race condition was to occur and the system was not built with the appropriate code guards in their logic? If a race condition occurs, something like this may happen. My wife requests to view the balance and sees $100. At the same time, I do exactly the same action and also see $100. Both of us request the $40 transaction again at the exact same time. Independently, the smartphone and the ATM both assume the balance is $100. So they subtract the value of $40 from it and then get a result of $60. The devices then write back to the server $60. Now, instead of the account reflecting $20 as it should, it thinks that there is only $60. That is the incorrect value and was created by a race condition. This bug may be great for me but it's not great for the bank and is definitely not going to be great for the bank's programmer. If the bank system had used synchronization properly, this issue wouldn't have been created. Before we move into how to resolve race conditions, let's look first at a non-theoretical race condition, one that can easily occur on a microcontroller. PIC16 and PIC18 devices work with 8-bit registers meaning that only 8 bits of data may be exchanged at one time. What happens when working with a peripheral which operates at 16 bits? A peripheral like timer 1. 
When reading the active count of timer 1, the value is stored in two separate registers, TMR1H, which is the high register, and TMR1L, which is for the low register. Peripherals operate truly concurrent to microcontroller's code execution. This is parallelism, which will be further described later in the course. For now, just understand that peripherals work independently at processing their concurrent task. For now, let's suppose that the high register has a current value of 00, zero and the low register has a value of FF. Our code requires to know the timer value. Since it is an 8-bit architecture, we must read both high and low registers separately. First, we read the high register, and we see that TMR1H contains a hex value of 00. zero. While going to read the low timer register, the peripheral ticks, and thus increments the active count. This increments the timer TMR1L, which rolls over, returning to a value of 00, zero which triggers the TMR1H to increment by a value of 1. Now we have already read the high register and are reading the low register and see a value of hex 00. zero. The result that our code believes timer 1 active count is, is now 0000, zero, zero, zero. while in reality, the value is 0100. Zero, that is a race condition, and it can be a very bad one if your system does not guard against it properly. There are a number of ways to protect your system. Primarily, your concern is to protect the critical section. One of the most simple ways to ensure proper value return is to stop your peripheral. This can be done with timer 1 by clearing the timer 1 on bit. Doing so prevents the active count from changing while executing from the critical section of code, which reads and stores the register value. After the critical section is completed, setting the timer 1 on bit resumes the peripheral's operation. This is not the only solution. It is just a simple example, which is cheap in code. If the peripheral cannot be paused for system design reasons, another method could be a redundant check. In this method, the code would read the high register, then the low register, and then once again read the high register. It would compare the first and the second reading of the high register to confirm that it has not changed. This is more expensive in code because it requires more operations and math comparisons, but it guarantees safe operation. In the end, these are all forms of synchronization. Stopping the peripheral prior to reading the register values is a form of mutual exclusion, often referred to as a mutex for short. Mutual exclusion is a synchronization method that excludes other processes from gaining access to critical sections of code. This allows for, for the processor to do atomic operations. Atomic operations are when a concurrent process is isolated, ensuring that it will run from start to finish without being stopped or interrupted at any point. The typical flow of an atomic operation is to enter a task, usually within a function call. It will then lock the system. For microcontrollers, this means that all peripheral interrupts must be disabled. They can continue to run, but the appropriate enable bits must be cleared to prevent code jump into the device interrupt vector. This can easily be done by clearing the general interrupt enable bit, the GIE, and the peripheral interrupt enable bits, which is the PEIE. We'll describe interrupts deeper later. After locking the system, the required process is to begin and must be allowed to run to completion. Once it has reached completion of its critical section, the system is unlocked and returns to normal operation. 
in general, true atomic operations are rare. True atomic operations cannot occur jitter and as a result are very critical to timing execution. The majority of processes can actually be implemented as just simple mutex designs used for synchronization. Mutex flags are Boolean variables used to signal a task execution upon request or upon a specific configured event. These are the best way to ensure efficient, full application processing without wasting time on unrequired task execution. Mutex locks are variables that ensure only one task uses a shared resource which contains a critical section. On microcontrollers, a good example would be an ADC. A product may have multiple sensors, but there is only a single ADC peripheral on chip. This means that the task which handles reading one sensor must make sure that an ADC is not currently being used to measure a value for another sensor's task. If a mutex lock design is not done, the system will run the risk of one task taking the value provided by a different task sensor. In systems with multiple processors, mutex locks are more accurately used to lock threads from being accessed by multiple processes at the same time. Mutex designs are always Boolean, and so are true or false. When a state is true, the lock is already claimed. If false, the lock is currently free and may be requested. Mutex flags are used when resources are being shared between multiple tasks. Here is an example of three separate tasks which share the same resource. This resource may be, used, may be a use of a peripheral or something like an encoding function. It doesn't really matter. It's just shared resource. Here we can see how it would work. Task A, B, and C all share the same resource. Task B is first to request its use, which returns that it is available. Task B then acquires the lock, claiming the resource. Now, when task A requests the resource, it will return with false, telling it that the resource is unavailable. Task B will then complete its operation and then release the lock, freeing it. Task A again will request the resource, which returns that it is now available. Task A will then acquire the lock and claim the resource. This will prevent task C from being able to acquire the lock upon request. Now, if we were to apply the mutex lock design to bank account example, it would look something like this. From the smartphone, my wife would request to pay the bill. From the ATM, I would request to withdraw the money. The smartphone acquires the lock from the bank system. It is then allowed to process its transaction and update the balance. After, the smartphone will release the lock. The ATM will then be able to acquire the lock. The ATM will then process its transaction and update the balance accordingly. Afterwards, the lock will be released. Here is an example of what a withdrawal may look like in code. A withdrawal of amount is to be performed. The system requests the lock on the bank account. The request comes back as false, indicating that the lock is free. The lock is then acquired, and the critical section where the bank account balance is modified is completed. After the lock is released and the withdrawal returns as true, indicating that it was successfully performed. Note that if the request of the lock returns as true, 
the withdrawal process will automatically return false, indicating that the withdrawal failed to be performed. Semaphores are variables or abstract data types that are used for controlling access by multiple processes to a common resource in a concurrent system. Where a mutex were based off of a single result, semaphores are based off of results of many different variations. Most common implementations of semaphores are done through by using multiple binary flags, conditional variables, or a combination of these. If using strictly binary flags, then two flag conditions would be required to be met for a processing action to occur. This means that if checking two different binary flags, there are a possibility of up to four corresponding actions, actions which can be executed. With conditional variables, that number of checks and corresponding actions can grow quite large based upon the design. For example, an 8-bit value can range from 0 to 255, which means that if this is used for a semaphore implementation, there could be up to 256 separate actions based upon a single variable's value. Let's apply a semaphore to a library study room analogy. In this example, there are three study rooms. The number of available rooms or free rooms is represented by the S variable value. Students must check in at the front desk and request a room. If available, they may acquire a room. If none are available, they are welcome to wait on the couch until a room has been released. Our first student arrives early to find that all rooms are available. They, are, they put in a request and acquire a, room, a study room right away. Another student arrives and requests a room. The second student acquires their own study room. The third student arrives and requests a room, and luckily they acquire the final room. A fourth student who slept in arrives and requests a room. They are told that all rooms are currently locked and are being used. The student goes to the couch and must wait for one of the shared resources, a study room, to become free. Luckily for them, the student who arrived second only had to study for a short test. So they released the room after only a short wait. The second student had a fast throughput to complete studying. As a result, the shared resource was freed up sooner. This allowed the fourth student to acquire the room to complete their task of studying. In this example, the students represented an application task requiring processing. The, the study room was sh a shared resource which could represent program memory space or peripheral usage or even just system execution cycles. The front desk was the code logic controlling the study room resources and managing the S variable value. Here is where a mutex and a semaphore implementation would matter. The couch represented a queue, which is a scheduling technique. It will later be discussed in this lecture. Producer and consumer design is another basic method to synchronize two tasks where at least one is dependent upon the other. This dependency means that there is a relationship between the task. This adds a system complexity. Understanding these system relationships in application design is fundamental to scheduling. Let's illustrate this point a little further by again using the library study rooms. The blue face represents a consumer who does something to the rooms with a specific state being true. In this example, the orange face represents a producer who is responsible for managing the room states and putting them into a state where the consumer will use them. 
Again, the blue face represents the consumer in this example, who must wait for the producer to complete all of its tasks. In this case, altering two of the room states. After this is completed, the consumer will then use this result for its dependent task. The producer then must wait for the consumer to complete its task before it may resume normal operation. These are the basics of synchronization. So let's now move into some system design concerns. Starvation is when a system's resources cannot be dedicated enough for stable task performance. Starvation can result from many performance efficiency or scalability issues, but often presents itself most with task priority. Let's again use the library analogy. This time, there are high priority students and low priority students. A low priority student arrives to find that all rooms are occupied by high priority students. So the low priority student must take a seat and wait. Shortly after arriving, another high priority student arrives. The rooms are still full, and so the high priority student must sit next to the low priority student on the queue. Right after sitting down, one of the rooms becomes available. It is released. So the high priority student gets up from the couch, from the queue, and takes the study room. The low priority student must keep waiting. After a little while longer, another high priority student arrives. Now the low priority student is getting a little bit worried. He still needs to study for his test, and the time in which that will occur is starting to grow closer. Then another one of the rooms opens up. Unfortunately, that high priority student who had just arrived is able to take that room. The low priority student is now hopeful to get another room to study in. That is, until another high priority student arrives. Now the low priority student is quite upset. This is exactly how starvation occurs. It is also why it is important to write functions which execute with fast throughputs and do not block in code when the processor could be handling other task operations. Deadlock occurs when a task fails to release a lock, or two or more competing actions are each waiting on each other to complete their task. An example of this would be if task A and B both require possession of variables lock one and lock two to operate to completion. Both locks can be acquired separately and are unaware of each other's states. An unguarded race condition which may occur is if task A acquires lock one, right as task B acquires lock two. Task A now requires lock two to reach completion, while task B now requires lock one to reach completion. Neither can release their lock because the task are still being processed and have not been completed. They have reached a deadlock state, and the application will fail as a result of neither task being able to release the lock that they possess. A common occurrence of deadlock with microcontrollers is when a lock is shared by mainline code and interrupt code. This creates an opportunity for a task in the mainline code to acquire the lock. An interrupt then occurs, which goes into the ISR, the interrupt service routine code, where the lock is required. 
But because the lock is held by a mainline code, it will never be released. This would prevent the interrupt service code from being able to execute completion. This would result in forever waiting inside of the ISR. The effects of starvation on a system are typically temporary, but may plague the system and occur at a high rate. This is reflected by major performance issues and variation in application behavior. Following the keys of concurrency will help to reduce the risk of starvation. Deadlock, however, will occur and will not be able to resolve itself. Deadlock conditions often occur as a result of race conditions. Abstracted, non-dependent, and well-architected code will help to reduce the risk of deadlock on a system. When working with a system operating multiple concurrent processes and tasks, there are three key concepts to understand. These are performance, efficiency, and scalability. Good performance is based on task throughput, system latency, and the effects of jitter. Throughput is a task execution length from start to finish. This can be a measurement of time or cycles. The main idea of having a small throughput is to make sure that when executing a task that it is not wasting time doing nothing. If it is waiting to consume data which is not ready, let the system do another task and return when the data is ready. Latency is the length of operation between the triggering of a requested action compared to when that action is actually completed and serviced. The lower the system latency, the better response time the application will have. Jitter is the variation of latency. It is typically created when one task interrupts or asserts priority over another during operation. This would cause the first task throughput to increase. The variation between normal ideal case and the actual length would be the jitter injection on the system. System efficiency comes down to best utilization of resources. This means small purposeful functions which only perform tasks which are necessary by utilizing mutex or semaphore practices. This good design will help make sure that every task will always finish and result in the expected result. This design will help make sure every task will always finish and result in the expected value. Optimizing the throughput of a system will allow it to better accommodate jitter and latency constraints. Scalability is important with code and system design. A task is scalable if modifications to a dependent task do not negatively affect the throughput capabilities of an isolated task. This means that if, a, if I am a consumer task and a producer task was modified or expanded, its changes did not affect me as a consumer and my throughput length. It should have only had an effect on the producer's throughput length. The task can be configured to accommodate multiple operations which improve or only mildly affect throughput latency. This is done easily if processes are well isolated to a purpose instead of being responsible for many different things. Scale up and scale out are important ideas of design. Scale up basically means that the task or process is well defined and scoped for a strict purpose within your product's application. It is very specialized. This allows for a tighter specification of work and design. Scaling up is great for embedded systems, which typically have limited resources. Scale out means that you are creating a task or process which has a broad definition of rule set. It will be required to accommodate a wide variety of features. This may make for a better general adaption process because it is easier to work with. 
The cost, however, is typically a large amount of resources which are required to support the broad implementations. Scaling out is good for computer or software systems where resources are more available. What tools does a microcontroller have? The most powerful tool which microcontrollers grant us as developers are interrupts. Next would be dedicated on-device hardware logic that allows for parallelism. This hardware is also known as peripherals, and they are what allow for easy scheduling with a microcontroller. Let's now discuss interrupts, what they are, how they work, and some rules to keep in mind when using them. Interrupts are signals generated which cause the core CPU to pause execution of code currently being run. Configured interrupts trigger the management of context saving of important register information to allow for safe switching during code execution. They allow the system to operate more responsive to time critical tasks and can improve efficiency when used correctly. Most importantly, it allows a microcontroller to support preemptive processing. Interrupts are widely configurable based upon the desired application usage. Interrupts work through dedicated hardware logic gates built into the microcontroller. They operate fully concurrent to the code execution, and so response speed is extremely fast. The global interrupt enable bit, GIE, is responsible for all interrupts core and peripheral related. It is the master access control. If cleared, it will prevent all interrupt events from remapping into the ISR. Peripheral interrupt enable, PEIE bit, is responsible for only the peripheral interrupts. If cleared, it will prevent peripheral interrupt events from remapping into the ISR but interrupt events which exist inside of the int con register will still be mapped into the ISR. The int con register manages core interrupt bits. This is the main interrupt control register. It manages typically timer zero, an external interrupt pin, and interrupt on change pin. Bit names which end with E stand for enable, while bit names that end with F stand for flags. The F bit will automatically be set by hardware. If the E bit is cleared, the F bit can still be read and processed through software without remapping into the ISR for processing. Setting the E bit will allow the microcontroller to pause mainline code execution and remap into the dedicated vector location within program memory space where the interrupt service routine exists. On a PIC 16, this is at hex 04. On PIC 18, hex 08 contains the low priority interrupt, while hex 18 contains the high priority interrupt. On PIC24 and PIC32 devices, it becomes very specific and reference to the datasheet is rec recommended. However, the general way that it works remains the same throughout all architectures. When configured interrupts events occur, the mainline code execution is paused. It is then remapped into the vector location of the ISR. Where it is processed, where a context save of 12 core registers is done to ensure the mainline code is restored exactly where it was before the interrupt trigger happened. 
The values stored in the 12 core registers seen here are copied into what are called shadow registers, which occupy a dedicated memory location, which guarantees safe context switching between mainline code and ISR. The 12 core registers will be required for ISR code operation as well. This is why the mainline code's core registers must be copied over into the shadow register upon the interrupt event. Devices such as the PIC18, which have high and low priority interrupts, support corresponding shadow register counts. So the PIC18 device will have two shadow registers to support the ability for two interrupt vector locations where code can be executed. The address location where the mainline code was previously executing from is pushed to the top of a hardware stack and will later be popped upon restoration, allowing the code to resume execution correctly. With the safe context switching achieved, code located inside of the ISR will begin to be executed. The ISR can be written completely in C code, just like the main line code. The function is identified by the qualifier underscore underscore interrupt. It has no parameters passed and is a void return type. The ISR should never be called from the main line code. It should always be handled by hardware. If this type of operation is required, it should be instead triggered using a peripheral interrupt. The compiler encodes ISR functions specially and handles linking routines to the interrupt vectors automatically. Upon entering the ISR, the GIE bit is cleared automatically by hardware. After completion, the RETFIE instruction is used as a return, but also includes restoration of the GIE bit to set. After ISR code is executed, the context of the mainline code is then restored. After which, the ISR will then also have the original 12 core registers restored back to their original state by parsing out the information from the shadow register. The values retained in the shadow registers will restore the original mainline code values. The code execution address is popped from the hardware stack, and the mainline code resumes processing from its previous location. The mainline code will then continue to be executed until the next interrupt trigger event occurs. This is what an interrupt would look like in C code. The main code has configured timer2 peripheral to generate a periodic interrupt. This was enabled by setting the TMR2IE bit inside of the peripheral interrupt enable 1 register, also known as the PI1 register. Since the PEIE bit is set, this interrupt allows the peripheral to trigger ISR entrance. Additionally, since the GIE bit is set, upon the interrupt event, the code will automatically enter the ISR. The mainline code does nothing. It just waits for the configured timer event to occur. When the timer overflows, the TMR2IF bit will automatically be set by hardware. This will trigger the entrance into the ISR, where the first thing to occur will be that the GIE bit will be cleared. Then context saving of the core registers is done into the shadow registers. The mainline code address is then pushed to the return stack. When context saving 
is completed, the code begins to execute from the ISR. The TMR2IF flag is then checked to see if it is true. Since the flag is set, the periodic timer related task must be handled. After the task handling is completed, the TMR2IF bit must be cleared by software. This code is very important as if the bit is not cleared, the code will become stuck within the ISR. Any remaining interrupt flags must be checked and then cleared upon task completion when required. After completion of all ISR flags handling, the code will exit the ISR function. The shadow registers will then be used to restore the 12 core registers. The GIE bit will then be restored automatically to set by hardware. The return address will pop from the stack and resume mainline code execution, there are some concerns with ISR operation. The ISR is very powerful when used correctly. Some of the potential problems include handling of race conditions, latency, jitter injection, the blocking nature of interrupts, and forming a false sense of priority associated with the timing that interrupts are processed. The most common cause of a race condition related to the ISR operation are typically a result of a direct global variable manipulation or usage from multiple locations within the code. For example, here the 16-bit variable i is declared globally and is incremented from within the main line code. In the ISR, timer 1 is being used for periodic events, and the value of i is checked as a conditional variable, which controls if a process is to be executed or not. This is the same race condition that we discussed earlier in a different way. i is a 16-bit variable, and the architecture is 8-bit. It is halfway through variable value update when the interrupt trigger event occurs. This results in the ISR value being captured as 0x100, whereas the conditional value check is against 0x150. As a result, the logical check becomes incorrect, and the process was skipped when it should have been called. Again, the simple solution to this is to clear the GIE bit from within the mainline code to prevent interruption while updating the shared variable value. In general, it is highly recommended not to use global variables in this way. Instead, abstract the variable management by using getter and setter functions. Sometimes when attempting to narrow down race conditions which are occurring between mainline code and ISR code, it is helpful to declare suspect variables as volatile. Volatile means that the compiler must assume the variable can be changed by an external factor and should not assume that it has remained the same value during optimization. This is equivalent to telling the compiler, do not touch me. ISR latency is very important to consider. Suppose that there are three peripheral tasks being handled in the ISR. If all three of these peripheral interrupts were triggered in sync, then upon entering the ISR, all three flags would be set awaiting processing. The first flag would be checked its task executed, and its flag cleared. Still within the ISR, the second flag would be checked, its task would be executed, and its flag cleared. Only then would the third flag be checked, its task executed, and flag cleared. 
Minimum latency would be different for each task. However, if only the application interrupt was triggered, the length of time to complete that task and exit the ISR would represent the minimum latency. Maximum latency would always be the combination of all tasks' minimum latencies, which are being executed sequentially. Note that latency also exists within the mainline code. Remember also that the mainline code and ISR latency are relatively independent from one another. Jitter injection, however, is directly related to the mainline code and ISR relationship. ISR tasks operate causing jitter injection onto mainline code. Jitter can be thought of how long the ISR blocked the mainline code's execution. So, in other words, how long was it required to stay within the ISR to complete all of its operations? The ISR can be considered blocking by nature just by its existence. If a task is being processed in the ISR, then the mainline code tasks are not being handled. So the longer the ISR task takes, the more jitter injection will occur. This will increase the mainline code's maximum latency and impact its overall performance. That is why it is very important to have short task throughputs which are executed from within the ISR. The golden rule of the ISR, however, is to make sure that all flags become cleared after tasks are handled, or you will forever become stuck within the ISR, never to return to the mainline code. Finally, remember to not fall prey to a false sense of priority related to the ISR. Just because a task is put at the top of the ISR does not guarantee that it will always be processed at minimum latency. Imagine that task one requires extremely low latency. Here, the ISR only manages three tasks. Task three has its interrupt trigger causing ISR entrance. While processing task three, Task 2 has its interrupt triggered. After task 3 completes processing, the code moves out of the bottom of the ISR. As soon as the GIE bit is restored, the ISR again is triggered for entrance by task 2's flag. The code loops back around into the ISR and just starts to process task 2. Almost right away, task 1's interrupt trigger occurs, followed by task 3's interrupt trigger. Since task 3 is checked next in the ISR sequence, it is again processed prior to task 1 finally being processed. This is why if a task requires near-instant response where latency variation cannot exist, Multiple interrupt vectors are required. These ensure context saving across multiple shadow registers and hardware priority is handled. For very time sensitive tasks, interrupt isolation is always recommended. Different PIC architectures offer different options. On PIC 16, currently, there is only a single ISR. On PIC18 devices, currently there is a high and the low priority ISR. PIC24 and PIC32s have a collection of vector interrupts with various priority configurations. It is likely that vector interrupt designs will exist on some 8-bit devices in the near future. In review, some general rules of the ISR are keep task throughput short. This improves system latency and mitigates jitter injection. Avoid anything which is blocking or waiting on data when executing from the ISR. 
do not rely on the order in which the ISR tasks are processed. Avoid the use of shared global variables, which can be accessed by mainline code and ISR. Now, moving on to lab one. This course is supported by three demonstration labs, as well as flowcharts to easily show application design. The intention of lab one is to have a simple application which has not followed the keys of concurrency or the rules of ISR operation. It will quickly and easily demonstrate the effects of jitter and latency on performance. It also demonstrates a product which would not be easily scalable or able to quickly add last minute features. Lab two modifies the application of lab one adding in a basic scheduler and using mutex and semi system designs for improved performance. The code is less abstracted and easier to follow than in Lab 3. Lab 3 supplies a more extensive application scheduler using techniques discussed further in the lecture. While the labs are meant primarily to demonstrate the ideas discussed within this lecture, they too should supply a basic framework to develop future applications upon. To perform the labs, the only development tool required will be the MPLAB Express Evaluation Board. This board is populated with a PIC18F25K50 located on the bottom of the board, which allows for easy drag and drop programming of the host microcontroller, the PIC 16F18855, located at the top of the board. The express board supports four LEDs, a push button, a potentiometer, an I squared C temperature sensor, and generic micro clickboard connectors for quick development and prototyping. Lab one will demonstrate the use of interrupts and concurrency issues caused by the lack of proper code scheduling design. The objectives of Lab 1 are to demonstrate concurrency issues which are physically observable on the board, illustrate in code poor programming decisions which cause large impacts on system performance, visually show effects of latency on mainline application processing, and observe jitter injection as a result of lengthy ISR throughput tasks. In conclusion of Lab 1, it demonstrated basic interrupt triggering task processing. It allowed the user to experience the effects of lengthy throughput, poor latency, and in jitter injection on a system's performance. And it created blocking and inefficient code which visually showed repercussions of that type of code design as well as large ISR jitter injection. Next to interrupts, the most powerful tool in a microcontroller's box are their peripherals. Through use of peripherals, microcontrollers are capable of achieving parallelism. Parallelism is defined as the state of being parallel or of corresponding in some way. With computer systems, it is the use of parallel processing. Microcontrollers achieve this by having dedicated hardware logic built in to handle peripheral processing independently from the core code being required to interact with it. After configuration or setup, the peripheral will work in the background continuously executing its concurrent task until stopped or reconfigured. Upon reaching completion of its task, the peripheral will make available to the user the result. It will then repeat the concurrent action regardless of if that result was taken or used by the code. Its processing is independent from the code being executed. Usage can include monitoring a sensor input value, driving a modulated signal output, or leveraging the internal hardware logic 
to affect behavior of a connected external device. Implementations of how the peripherals are used can vary depending upon design requirements. Some examples may include using an ADC peripheral but with the enable bit cleared. In software, the flag bit is monitored. When set, the peripheral has completed the conversion and is ready for the mainline code to read the result from the register for use. This would be an example of a purely cooperative processing. Another would be using the I squared C peripheral, this time with the enable bit set. Upon requesting an I squared C communication, the ISR will be entered and process the bus communication. After, it will release control back to the mainline code. This would be an example of preemptive processing. A third example would be using the COG peripheral, the configurable output generator, which is one of the microchip's core independent peripherals, CIPs. After initial configuration, CIPs require no interaction with the mainline code and also do not require execution from the ISR. They are truly independent concurrent task executors. The only resource consumed to support CIPs are the hardware pins used as input or output signal paths. No core execution cycles are used at all for the functionality is handled by dedicated internal logic gates. Let's discuss peripherals from core independent peripherals once more. Standard peripherals will execute concurrent tasks without consuming core cycles through parallelism. Upon result completion, the core will be required to use instruction cycles to request the result from the peripheral. In code, it will then require instruction cycles to process that response. Even if the interrupt is generated upon peripheral result completion, the core is required to process the task request through the ISR. Core independent peripherals, however, also execute concurrent tasks without consuming core cycles through parallelism. However, this time upon the results completion, dedicated hardware logic will automatically output the result without needing for a request to be handled. The result signal is outputted automatically external or even internal to the microcontroller with no core cycles consumed. CIPs do not require ISR execution. That is a minor but vital distinction between peripherals and core independent peripherals. A CIP can be configured to behave or used like a standard peripheral, but per standard peripherals are not capable of achieving all of the features which a CIP can. Here is a small example of implementations of both standard and core independent peripherals on a PIC16F1614 or 8 device. This design is intended to control a single phase brushless DC motor using a full bridge driver circuit. In the past, doing this would require a lot of math, code, and logical choices to be made. Now everything is handled by the CIPs and dedicated hardware. The majority of work is being handled by the CIPs and dedicated hardware. This results in a massive increase in response time capability as a result of the hardware always being able to execute faster than software. On top of that, the majority of resources are now freed up on the microcontroller, with its only responsibilities now being to process USART communication and monitor a single ADC channel. The ADC works as an emergency shutoff in case of dangerous temperature levels. Otherwise, the entire system is only dependent upon an external PWM signal and the desired behavior of the motor is managed completely by the CIPs and its dedicated hardware. 
That covers all the fundamental concepts which are required to be understood before developing a scheduler for your application. Those were the tools. Now let's discuss how best to use them. Scheduling is a method which determines the order and duration of a task execution on the CPU. Schedulers are best to ensure management of all concurrent tasks of an application. They help the CPU stay busy while only doing work which is required instead of redundant or unnecessary tasks. They help to maximize the throughput by being able to shuffle task processing. They help minimize latency with good design to ensure agile and responsive behavior. They allow for the maximization of fairness between task allocation and competition of the resources. Finally, they make the requirements of meeting deadlines easier to maintain. There are two real scheduling processes, cooperative processing and preemptive processing. Hybrid processing is a combination of the two. Cooperative processing is a type of scheduling where the CPU does not force a switch in the task processing if currently executing a task. Instead, tasks cooperatively relinquish control voluntarily upon completion. Cooperative processing is the most common and is what can be considered the mainline code. Within the while one loop of mainline code are a collection of tasks, which will be processed one at a time in sequential order. One task cannot interrupt or preempt another. Once a task has, complete, has begun execution, only it may relinquish control for another task to begin. The code for this would look very familiar. The cooperative code after initialization and startup configuration will print dispatching, execute task one, task two, and then task three. It will then finish execution of all cooperative processes. Then it will loop back around the while one loop to continue this sequential execution. The purpose of cooperative scheduling is to manage tasks through multi-programming. It helps to ensure synchronization of variable and peripheral interactions. It handles standard operations of the application, as well as typically used for idle, low, or mid-priority tasks, which require periodic or reoccurring processing. Some general concerns for cooperative scheduling should include the possibility of corruption of a task execution, which would result in unexpected system behavior. Tasks which fail to release and create system deadlock. Designs should account for all possible latency variations and should have a strong understanding of jitter effects on the system. Preemption is a scheduling process which allows the CPU to switch task processing regardless of execution location. This allows for a task to interrupt another task and claim the core processor for execution of its process. Interrupt processing can be considered preemptive. This is because while executing code from the main line, an interrupt can occur which preemptively remaps to the ISR vector. Once in the ISR, all tasks are still processed cooperatively. This is because if in the middle of processing a task in the ISR, it will be required to relinquish control for the next ISR task to be processed. Let's use PIC18 real quick for an example. Mainline code is allowed to be preempted by a low priority ISR, which will then start to process the low priority task cooperatively. Since the PIC18 has two ISR locations, the high priority ISR can then preempt the low priority ISR. However, once within the high priority ISR, it may only process cooperatively. 
True, pure, preemptive systems are far more complicated and require large amounts of dedicated resources for system stability. Remember that on a pure, preemptive system, every task must be able to yield to another task at any point of execution. This means whatever the task is, its task is independent in its own operation and can be considered basically its own application. So, each application would have to maintain its own function call stack, variable stack, and any other relevant context information. This is a huge amount of resources required for every operation which the system may be responsible for. But that is the requirement to guarantee stability within a purely preemptive system. It is an all or nothing kind of situation. You must pay the cost in resources that equates to larger, more expensive components. Each required task would have to be in its own individual project, which then has its own reset vector position offset inside of the program memory. The application would be responsible for an individual task. Push button monitoring, sensor measurement, menu navigation handling, etc. Each would have to have its own main function, which it then would typically run to completion. Any required retention of values to alter operation must be stored in a known address location for future reference. After completion of a task code, it is the application's requirement to restore its own execution address back to its original reset vector location it was offset to. This prevents processing into a different application's dedicated program memory location. If one task application is dependent upon a shared resource variable, for example, the menu navigator needs to know the state of a button, then both applications would have to be aware of the specific memory address location where that variable is stored. Since it is a shared variable, a second address location would be required to act as a mutex lock status for that variable. These required interactions and low-level system knowledge makes pure preemptive systems very complex and difficult to develop. Consider the number of tasks typically managed by a single microcontroller. Now think of the amount of resources that would be required to operate it. Let's now consider how this pure preemptive design would operate on a PIC16 device. Upon reset, the part would start code execution from address location 00. It would execute the system initialization, which configures all hardware for operation across all of the parts of the application. It would check if it should stay in the bootloader, which would works as an atomic blocking operation. If not requested, the code would enter the while one loop until the system's periodic timer overflows. Once this occurs, it will enter the ISR and never return to this while one loop. It will forever operate primarily from the ISR. Now within the ISR, it will process and clear the flag. It will restore all of application one's parameters consisting of the function call stack, variable values, and hardware call stack, the current address executing from, and any other required information. The code will then begin to execute from that address location, where, wherever that application's reset vector was offset to. It will execute itself to completion, and then restore its own dedicated code execution address location. Upon the next periodic timed event, the flag will be set returning the code execution to the ISR. All application context information must then be stored off. The next application's context information will then be inserted. The ISR is then exited, and because of the new context information, code execution will begin from the new mapped reset vector location. 
This type of design, through use of a single timer and a manual context man manipulation, is typically what an RTOS will do for on a microcontroller. RTOSes will leverage the compiler to create its preemptive system, reducing some of the resource costs and management of heartache. As discussed previously, though, it is a scaled out design and will always carry overhead cost. Instead of just a periodic timer, it is additionally possible to set up other interrupts, like the interrupt on change associated with a push button, to prioritize restoration of its management application. But additional resources would be required to manage this logic. It also increases the risk of starvation and the complexity of configuring the RTOS for operation. The purpose of a preemptive scheduler is to process tasks with minimum latency upon triggered events, external or configured. It will manage time-sensitive processes which must be handled upon or very close to an event trigger. Also modify or update system parameters affecting the way the cooperative process may occur. Some concerns with preemptive scheduling include it should not have lengthy throughputs or possibly blocking tasks. You should still be aware of the priority pitfall relationship when assigning the order or prioritizing task handling. It is important to perform minimum task processing as quickly as possible. On microcontrollers, typical applications are built as hybrid of combination and preemptive scheduling. Through combination, cooperative scheduling can improve performance while preemptive can expect a resource cost reduction. It allows for actions or tasks to be preemptively requested but cooperatively processed. This will give the system more control on deciding task prioritization. Now, let's get into Lab 2. The objectives of Lab 2 are to redesign Lab 1 code using cooperative and preemptive scheduling. We will add a simple cooperative time-based task scheduler using a timer peripheral managed preemptively. Additionally, it will redesign the ISR operations to minimize jitter injection and improve overall system latency and performance. In conclusion to Lab 2, it demonstrated a simple scheduler with basic preemptive task scheduling and cooperative execution. It also had you explore the modified and expanded inefficient code which had created concurrency issues in Lab 1 but now allows for an improved system performance. Through this exploration, we were able to observe implementations of mutex, semaphore, and conditional variables which allowed for more responsive application behavior and general system improvements. Our tosses have been referred to a few times throughout this lecture. Let's now discuss them in a little more detail. A real-time operating system, an RTOS, handles multitasking scheduling for all processes required by the application. It will maintain time deadlines and functionality under real-time constraints as defined by the developer. It will also abstract possible development complexity away from scheduler development. With an RTOS, the user will have tasks written which are required by the application program. They put these tasks into the RTOS, which will manage the hardware requirements for those tasks. Through this design, it is easy to develop large, complex systems where the user may not have intricate knowledge of the drivers or APIs being used. The RTOS will then figure out how best to distribute the core processor's usage. It will manage all required context-sensitive data, as well as variable interactions between task and retention of values. In other words, it does all the things discussed previously in this lecture. The RTOS simply abstracts that away from the user and expects only the task functions which are required for the application.
Depending upon the RTOS, it may or may not leverage full usage of the compilers or may only be supported by a very limited number of compilers available to the field. Because of this constraint, an RTOS will be broader or scaled out in its design. This means it may require large resources and perform less efficient than a developer created scheduler, which is a more narrow or scaled up design. The positives of an RTOS architecture are that they will handle resource and memory management for you. It will take care of task scheduling, abstracting away those complexities from the users. Some of the negatives are that they will require a large or dedicated amount of resources, even for some features which may never be used. An RTOS cost is upfront and automatically consumes some component resources. All functions that are written for task management and use by the RTOS will still need to be coded and will also still consume resources. Setup and configuration of the RTOS is still dependent upon the user's knowledge of its commands, usage, and general architecture. Let's talk finally about some of the basic scheduling techniques which support many usages in system design and operation. The most standard way to schedule tasks is to execute them sequentially. This is as simple as it looks. You execute one task, then the next, until all tasks have been processed. Once completed, you loop back around to the top and repeat the cycle. The pros to sequential scheduling are that the code is easy to follow, it is linear, making it simple to navigate, and it executes in a defined order each time with no variation if not preempted. Some cons are that it can lead to lengthy total throughput of the entire system. It is more likely to be performing more work than is required if not combined with other techniques. Largely, it is affected by variations in latency. Implementations of the scheduler technique are used in the lab for the scheduler ticker and for dequeuer. The push button in particular should be referred, referenced as it is called often and thus uses a pass-through method of programming. Pass-through is a good method when tasks are called often and must be processed within a very fast throughput. It is described in more detail within Lab 2's description section. The round robin processing technique uses sequential processing in a modified way. Whereas sequential would do task 1 and task 2 and task 3 and so on, round robin will do task one, then task two, then task three, and so on. Sequential does them all in one pass of the while one loop. Round robin will only do a single task for each pass of the while one loop. But it will sequentially rotate through those tasks for th each iteration through the while one loop. The pros to sequential scheduling are that code automatically rotates between task execution. It is easy to manage and expand for additional tasks. It reduces the total throughput on, of a system by dividing up the responsibilities. It also allows for module function development, which is easy to architect and manage. Some of the cons are the latency of the task depends on the position being processed whenever the event arrives. Use of the function pointers can sometimes make the code more complex to read. Round robins cannot guarantee instant or even minimal latency response time. Implementations of the round robin technique can be found in the lab used for the low priority task handler. Basic priority is typically a mutex decision of some type. This task, or that task, whatever the logic is for the choice, really just depend, depends on the design. 
Let's say task two is more important than task one. Task two only requires processing, however, when an event occurs, but it has a much longer throughput than task one. Task one needs to be processed more often, but is less vital to stability. It has a very short throughput. In this example, we can use a flag to dictate which task will be handled. If false, task one is executed. If true, however, task two requires execution. In this way, task one is executed the majority of the time, but whenever the event occurs, task two is prioritized. The pros to basic priority scheduling are it can prevent unrequired work from being performed with minimal overhead. It's very easy to alter the system's behavior based upon a single Boolean variable state. And it is the simplest form of synchronization. Some of the cons are that it must ensure that the variable state is retained and the guards are put in place to prevent corruption. It can block or starve a task. Again, Referring to our previous example, imagine if two had been called continuously. Task one would be blocked from processing and would starve. Remember that it was re a requirement of task one that it must be called often. Another con would be that it can cause a wide variance to the total throughput or the latency of the system. Task two is much longer than task one. And therefore, whenever task two must happen, the system latency would automatically increase. Implementations of a basic priority technique in these labs can be found for the basic priority handler, which had a high priority task, or called the low priority round robin handler. Advanced priority is a semaphore where basic was a mutex. It is just additional logical checks. In this slide's example, the flag has the highest priority. So task one is ignored, prioritizing the flag for execution. The pros to advanced priority techniques are that additional logical checks allow for more options for the application's execution. It is, again, easily expandable when structured correctly. It allows for much better system control as a result of the increase to the amount of information about the system known, allowing for more detailed synchronization decisions. Some of the cons include that it may make the code more complicated. There are more chances for bugs to sneak in. However, writing well-isolated, abstracted code makes finding these bugs much easier. It also will require the scheduler to have better oversight and understanding of the system. Once again, a good upfront design specification is suggested and will help overcome any of these problems. More variables must be maintained and stored, which increases the general resource cost of implementing an advanced priority system. An implementation of the advanced priority technique can be found inside the lab for the LED alarm state of operation. The stage technique is best used when a full task has too lengthy of a throughput. The task is then broken down into separate executable stages. Each pass through the task will process a single stage and release. In this way, the stages are processed using a round robin technique. As you can see here, Task one executes and then handles just stage 2A and then goes to task three. On its next pass, it will do task one again, stage 2B, and then task three. It will continue to this so on and so forth until it has completed all stage executions and it will then begin from the start uh, once more. The pros to a staged execution technique are that it breaks up a lengthy task into small manageable parts. This allows for a reduction to the total system throughput length. It is useful to create state machines to manage the code, which may require a delay. 
This allows us to avoid blocking code or waiting for a data variable to be freed up by the system. Also, it makes it easier to debug problems as a result of the more isolated code. Some of the cons are that it will increase the total throughput of the stage task being processed from start to finish. And this is a result of having to basically cycle through the cooperative handling multiple times and through multiple iterations. This will result in a longer latency for any of any stage task and will require dedicated variable to manage the state of the stage task. It is also very important that it protects itself against corruption of its state. Implementations of a stage technique in the labs can be found for the diagnostic printout used in lab three. The scheduled technique is perhaps the most useful for multitasking management. It works by having a dedicated peripheral timer used to maintain a timer tick value. This value is used to build scheduler tasks which are processed cooperatively. Scheduled tasks can be processed using many techniques depending upon system requirements. In this example, we can see that task A will be executed every 10 milliseconds, task B every 100 milliseconds, and task 3 upon every one second event. In this example implementation, the scheduled events are processed sequentially. So the first second task will cure, sorry, so the one second task will occur the latency costs of the 10 millisecond and 100 millisecond throughput task execution. This means that the 10 millisecond task will occur nine times before the 100 millisecond task occurs. Also, on the one second event, the 10 millisecond task will be processed and then the 100 millisecond task will be processed before the one second event is processed. Again, this is only an example implementation and can be modified and expanded to conform to the product's task processing needs. The pros to a scheduled technique are that you have better control over timed or periodic events. Typically, it's easier to read and follow the code logically. It isolates and abstracts code work to predictable intervals and it is ideal for managing performance of a cooperative system. Finally, it is easy to expand for future features and creates very flexible applications. Some of the cons are that it requires a dedicated and accurate timer or clock source used to create the ticker value. Resources are required to manage and maintain the ticker for the scheduler. The timer or clock should occupy the highest priority preemptive interrupt. It will inject jitter onto cooperative system processing as a result of ticker maintenance. For resource constrained systems, a strong application scope will be required for most efficient system architecture to ensure meeting of all required deadlines. An implementation of the stage technique can be found in the labs for the scheduled ticker and the queue builder. Queuing is a technique where triggered events are acknowledged and stored for later execution. When an event occurs, the corresponding task responsibility is enqueued. It adds it to the queue. The queue is filled with triggered task. It can fill from bottom up or top down. This depends upon how it is intended to be processed. Also, if there needs to be any type of prioritization within the queue. This can be done until the queue is full. The pros to a queue technique are that it allows for a dynamic list population of defined system events. It can be sorted or rearranged to meet system priority requirements. It is easy to modify the queue, references, or method of enqueuing. 
Some of the cons are that the population order of the list can be non-deterministic. It may be complex or difficult to navigate without knowledge of system architecture. It must manage and prevent queue overflows. Event triggering intervals versus the processing throughput relationship must be managed. This means that the queue should not be able to fill faster than it can be emptied, or that tasks added to the list must always be handled to prevent task starvation. Additionally, queues can sometimes make it more difficult to read the code at a glance. Implementations of the queue technique can be found in the lab for the queue builder. If queuing is done, then a dequeuing technique must also be used along with it. Like the queue, the design can be adjusted to match the needs of the application. For this example, the dequeue is a second separate buffer which directly copies out from the queue once it has been filled. By making them separate, when the queue becomes free, more tasks can be produced or enqueued, later to be consumed by the dequeuer. Again, like the queue, the technique used to dequeue or execute the queue depends on the system requirements. For this example, when the dequeue buffer becomes full, it triggers sequential processing of all tasks. The pros to the DQ technique are that processing a queue task can be done using a variety of techniques. It requires little modification to alter methods of processing or dequeuing. Advanced logic decisions can easier be added or removed or expanded upon without affecting the queuing process. Some of the cons are that it must be able to empty faster than filled, and it must be able to process all of the tasks. This means that your dequeuer must not starve the system or any task within the queue. Implementations of the dequeue technique in the labs are seen for the queue executor. Let's now walk through a quick scheduler example which combines the use of all of these techniques. We're going to call it a round robin scheduler. The rule is that each task must only be processed for a length of quantum time, in this case, a value of 2. There are four tasks managed by the scheduler. Each has its own burst time, representing the total throughput length required for each task to reach completion if op executed atomically. Task 1 has a value, a burst time value of 2. Task 2 has a burst time value of 4. Task 3 has a burst time value of 3. Task 4 has a burst time value of 5. Since task 2, 3, and 4 all have burst times larger than the allowed quantum time, we know that they must be broken up into stages using the staged execution technique. Task 2 has two stages, each stage with its own stage burst time of 2. Task 3 also has two stages, but stage 1 will have a burst time of 2, while stage 2 will only have a burst time of 1. Stage 4 has three stages. Stage 1 and 2 will contain burst times of a value of 2, while stage 3 will be a burst time of 1. This round robin is then executed sequentially. In addition, it uses a queue, which makes sure that all four tasks complete before the round robin is reloaded and started over. The queue always loads the same, from task one to task four. The result is the scheduler will process as follows. All of stage one will be executed. Stage one of task two will be executed. Stage 1 of task 3 will then be executed. Stage 1 of task 4 will then be executed. Stage 2 
of task two will then be executed. Stage two of task three will then be executed. Stage two of task four will then be executed. And finally, stage three of task four will then be executed. With all tasks completely executed, the process will then be repeated. Now, let's get into the code of lab three. The objectives of Lab 3 are to expand Lab 2 with additional process scheduling techniques, supply code examples and implementations of the discussed techniques, and finally, develop an expansive application using a hybrid of cooperative and preemptive processing scheduling. In conclusion of Lab 3, it created a simple but expansive demonstration application using multiple scheduling techniques. It implemented a semaphore design in the ISR to mitigate the impact of preemptive task processing on the scheduler timer value. It followed preemptively requested and cooperatively processed principles by moving the majority of the code execution to the mainline code and out from the ISR. Finally, it encouraged additional learning with a challenging bonus problem, which would require the developer to have a good knowledge of the scheduling techniques discussed within this course. And those are all the important fundamental concepts needed to write a good scheduler. So in summary, today we covered concurrency how race conditions occur, and the methods of synchronization to overcome them, interrupts, the hardware and the configuration of them, shadow registers and context switching, which is done for you automatically by the microcontroller hardware, parallelism, which is used to achieve multitasking through peripheral and CIPs, cooperative and preemptive scheduling, the two types of process scheduling, RTOS architectures, what they do and require, how they operate, and how they are executed. And finally, techniques for scheduling with a PIC microcontroller, how they can be combined to create ideal, scaled up designs for all of your application needs. Some additional resources include book publications, Making Embedded Systems by Alicia White, and embedded multitasking with small microcontrollers by Keith E. Curtis. These online sources are also recommended. These three episodes by the Software Engineering Radio, in particular, do a great job of covering concurrency. Building an instant up real-time operating system, a blog post on the embedded website does a good job of describing ways of scheduling applications. And finally, Adam Dunkel's website will talk about proto-threads, which is a bit more applicable to computer systems and computer science than embedded systems, but the concepts are still important to understand. Uh, and finally, Thank you for attending my class. Once again, my name is Chris Tucker, and I am a senior applications engineer here at Microchip Technology.